Today we are going to study atrial fibrillation which is the most commonly diagnosed cardiac arrhythmia that results from structural or electrophysiological irregularities within the atrial tissue. We are going to study its management. So, the management of atrial fibrillation has two aspects. Whenever there is a new onset atrial fibrillation, we we'll either do the rate control or rhythm control. Another strategy that we have to employ is anticoagulation. First of all, we will discuss about the rate control. So when do we do the rate control? It is usually the first strategy. Whenever any patient has atrial fibrillation, is diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, and what are the drugs that we use for rate control? We can remember it with the name of A, B, C, D. Amiodron, beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, and digoxin. We will discuss it later on. And what should be the target heart rate whenever we do the rate control? If the patient has symptoms of atrial fibrillation, like shortness of breath, fatigue, loss of consciousness, or palpitations, then the target should be less than 80 beats per minute. Or if the patient has ejection fraction less than 40%, then the target should be less than 80%. On the other hand, if the patient is asymptomatic and his ejection, his or her ejection fraction is more than 40%, then the target should be less than 110 beats per minute. So, first of all, we will discuss the drugs that are employed in the rate control beta blocker when we do use the beta blocker mostly whenever a patient has coronary artery disease along with atrial fibrillation we use the beta blocker and the, the most commonly used beta blocker is metoprolol also known as low pressure or tropirol it is used 2.5 to 5 milligram over two minutes that's the loading dose and we may repeat it in five minutes we can repeat it three times and what is the maintenance dose after we give the patient loading dose? It is 25 to 100 milligram BID or TID. These doses are not essential for any USMLE exams. These are for practical. Anyone who is in the hospital, working in the hospital, must remember the doses. Otherwise, if you are doing a USMLE exam, you don't need to remember these. Next is calcium channel blocker. There are two calcium channel blockers that can be used in the rate control. Those are cardioselective, virapamil and diltiazem. The dose of virapamil, virapamil is also known as isoptin or calon. Uh, its loading dose is 5 to 10 milligram over 2 minutes. We usually use 5 milligrams and we may repeat it in 30 minutes. What is the loading dose? Uh, after the loading dose, what is the maintenance dose of virapamil? It's 120 to 360 milligram per day. We do, we give it in BID or TID doses. It, the uh, maintenance dose of virapamil is the same as diltiazem. And maintenance dose is same as diltiazem, of diltiazem uh, but the loading dose is different. Loading dose for diltiazem is 0 0.25 milligram per kg and we give it over two minutes. And we may repeat it after 15 minutes if heart rate is still not under control. Next, we come to B, C, and D, digoxin. And digoxin, the loading dose of digoxin. When, when we use the digoxin, we must remember whenever any patient with atrial fibrillation has congestive cardiac failure. So, digoxin is appropriate choice at that time. Uh, the loading dose is 0 0.25 milligram, and we can give it every two hours. And the maximum dose in one day we can use is 1.5 milligram in whole day and the maintenance dose is 0 0.125 to 0 0.375 milligram once daily and the last whenever we are unable to control with B, C, D then we use amiodron. Amiodron is antiarrhythmic drugs but it can also be used to have rate control. The loading dose is 300 milligram and we give in an infusion over one hour. And the maintenance dose is one milligram per kg per hour. That's almost 10 to 50 milligram per hour. And we give for 24 hours. So 
If the patient has any coronary artery disease, we prefer beta blocker. If the patient has COPD, then we prefer calcium channel blockers, either, either verapamil or deltiazem. And if the patient has concomitant congestive cardiac failure, then we prefer digoxin. And amiodron is used in the end. Okay. Now, next comes the rhythm, rhythm control. When we employ the rhythm control, when there are symptoms despite the use of rate control medications, A, B, C, D, or there is failure of those medications. Another indication is when there is tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy, then we have to do the rhythm control. So what are the drugs that we use for rhythm control? We use class three antiarrhythmic drugs. We can remember it with the mnemonic of AIDS, A-I-D-S. A for amiodron, I for abutilide, D for dufetilide, and another D, doranadron, and sotilol. So AIDS plus three antiarrhythmic drugs. First of all, we will discuss A, amiodron. We already discussed its dose, 300 milligram or one hour, and then we give 10 to 15 milligram per hour for 24 hours for to conversion, uh, to convert the patient into sinus rhythm. And then the maintenance dose is 200 to 300 milligram once daily. The next drug is ibutilide. Uh, its dose for converting to sinus rhythm is 1 milligram per kg and we give it over 10 minutes. We can repeat it once. There is no maintenance dose for ibutilide. Next is D, dufetilide. Uh, it's loading and maintenance dose is same, 500 microgram. It's not milligram, it's microgram. BID is given orally. This is an oral medication. Uh, another medication that we can use in rhythm control of class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs is dronadron. The loading dose or the dose for the conversion to sinus rhythm is not known, but the maintenance dose is 400 milligram BID. And the last Class 3 antiarrhythmic drug is Sotelol. Sotelol is also a beta blocker and uh, its loading dose is also unknown, uh, but its maintenance dose is 80 to 160 milligram BID. It's also a oral medication. Uh, another class that we can use for rhythm control in atrial fibrillation is class 1C antiarrhythmic drugs. There are two drugs. They need to be mentioned flaconide and propofenone. And these are the dosages of the, those drugs. So if you want to remember, you can see it from here. So first, we have to summarize. Whenever there is new onset atrial fibrillation, we either do the rate control or the rhythm control. So if patient has recurrent atrial fibrillation despite these strategies, what do we have to do the next? then we need to see two things, whether the atrial fibrillation is within 48 hours or more than 48 hours, our patient is low risk or high risk. It, having atrial fibrillation less than 48 hours is has less risk itself. So if the patient has atrial fibrillation less than 48 hours uh, and patient is low risk for thromboembolism, then we do the cardioversion. On the other hand, if the patient has atrial fibrillation more than 48 hours, or we don't know about the duration, duration is unknown, or the patient has high risk for stroke, then we have to give patient anticoagulation. So there are two ways we can do it. Either we give patient empirically anticoagulation for three weeks before cardioversion, or we can do transthoracic echo to rule out any thrombus in the heart. If the patient has thrombus in the heart, then we can go for empiric anticoagulation. But on the other hand, if patient doesn't have any, uh, any thrombi or, uh, within the left atrium, then we can directly go to the cardioversion. And because this is a high risk for thromboembolic phenomena, so, so after the cardioversion is done, we give a four weeks of anticoagulation to every patient who has more than 48 hours or unknown duration of atrial fibrillation or high risk patients. We give 
four weeks of anticoagulation. So next, uh, and all the patients who are uh, who have atrial fibrillation must be anticoagulated based on their chad vesc score. So what does the chad vesc score stands for? C stands for congestive cardiac failure, H for hypertension, A for age more than 75. It gives you two points. And D for diabetes, S for stroke, TIA, thromboembolism, and V for vascular disease like MI, peripheral arterial disease, and A for age again, but age is less here, 65 to 74. It gives you one point. And last is sex category. So females have one point. So how do we proceed after we calculate the chad vesc score? So if the chad vesc score is zero, we don't need any treatment. And if the chad vesc score is one, we either give patient aspirin or anticoagulation. Uh, and if the patient has chad vesc score of two or more, then there is no option other than anticoagulation. So then we divide the patients in two categories, whether the patient has valvular atrial fibrillation or non-valvular atrial fibrillation. The valvular causes of atrial fibrillation are rheumatic heart disease, any patient with valve prosthesis or repair. Then in these cases, we have no choice other than warfarin or coumarin. And the INR should be between two to three. On the other hand, if the patient have non-valvular atrial fibrillation, like other causes of atrial fibrillation, hyperthyroidism and other causes, then we give warfarin or novel oral anticoagulant. So we have two choices there. So what are those novel oral anticoagulants? There are two categories of those novel oral anticoagulants, also known as NOAX. First is direct thrombin inhibitor, also known as dabigatron. Its dose is 150 milligram BID. And there are three drugs. Those are factor 10 inhibitor. 10 inhibitor or 10 it bands. Rivaroxaban, epixaban, endoxaban. So these seems to be 10A bands or 10 inhibitors. So the dose of rivaroxaban is 20 milligram once daily and epixaban is given 5 milligram twice a day and endoxaban is 60 milligram once daily. So there is one thing to remember. Whenever the creatinine clearance is less than 50, then we need to half the doses of all these drugs, the thrombin inhibitors and 10 inhibitors. So the demigatron would be 75 milligram, rivaroxaban will be 15, epixaban 2.5, and endoxaban 30 milligram. And there is only uh, demigatron who can be reversed if it has toxicity. It can be uh, reversed with a drug known as Prexbind.